Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 11. We're going to cover the whole chapter today. There's quite a bit here to cover. Um, my message is almost going to be divided up into two sections, but we're going to flow through everything. By all means, if you need to take notes, if you, if you, if you can't take notes, there's going to be some great, great bulletins here. Because we're going to address, um, address a question today that we find, or at least I've found, has come up often in conversations, um, especially with, between believers, right? But it also spills out of the church sometimes where uh, unbelievers kind of see this and think, well, the church isn't united. The church has too much infighting. So we're, you know what, we're going to talk about the good and the bad today uh, and, and just kind of address some issues. I was having coffee with Paul this morning, and he gave me a great illustration, so I'm going to steal this. But he said two, two believers meet each other, right? So they're, they're two Christians, they meet each other, and they're just asking, like, hey, dude, tell me about your church. Well, what about you? What do you believe in? So, hey, are you Baptist? Yeah, I'm Baptist. Oh, me too. That's awesome. Uh, you know, where do you go to church? Tell, tell me about your church. Do you guys have, like, a senior, one senior pastor? Yeah, we've got one pastor. Okay, cool. Me too. What about your uh, music? Do you guys uh, have a full band? Yeah, we have a full band. You guys have a choir too? Yeah, we have a choir. Okay, okay, cool. What about, do you guys like preach from King James Version? Like, yeah, me too. We preach from King James Version. So they're like all agreeing. The guy's like, dude, is your, is your pulpit made out of wood? He's like, no, it's made out of glass. Oh, you heretic. <laughs> you know? So here's the point I'm trying to make with that. We believers, so many times, will try to find and use the Bible and use passages of Scripture to cause separation amongst us, to cause um, conflict, to find things to disagree on versus finding things to agree on, right? Uh, versus coming together and saying, listen, we're Christian, we're believers. And one of those topics is the matter of law versus grace. Don't all start fighting now, right? Right? If, if, if I get pulled off the stage by somebody here, uh, it may happen. This might be the message. This might be the season finale for me. But that's, that's something we, we, we have very boisterous conversations around. Let's put it that way, right? The law, the Old Testament. Do we really need the Old Testament? Like, there's half a Bible here that we're like, is it really applicable to what we do today or not? Do we really need the Old Testament and the law and all that comes with it today or not? And, and I'll, I'll put it this way. There's two sides of the coin, right? So there's, there's the one side that says we don't need it. The Old Testament is, is somewhat outdated. It's really not like the Christian book. It's more of the Jewish law, the Jewish book. It's, it's what, what's known as the Torah so the, the synagogues, and we'll, we'll use it, right? It's, it's for Jewish people. It's really not for us. And the bigger problem with the Old Testament is the issues that we have to tackle because in the uh, PC world where you can't offend anybody, where it's a seeker-friendly culture in the churches where we want to invite people in, it's tough to talk about the Old Testament God, quote-unquote. Because the Old Testament God is the God that sends this flood that wipes out the world and kills all these people. Like, how do you witness to people? My God is a loving God. Like, that one time he killed a lot of people, but like, mostly. Like, nobody wants to bring up those issues. The God that leads the, the people of Israel into battle and wiping out cities and nations as they conquer the land. Like, you don't, that's a tough conversation to have with somebody who's not a believer. You worship a bloody God. That's a God, like, I don't know if I, can, if I can be a part of a religion or a faith system that worships a God that does some of the things that are, are said in the Old Testament. It's a little tough to swallow for people. Really, a God would do those kinds of things. We thought he was all loving and cuddly and, and nice and warm and, uh, and just good, right? How can a God be so judgmental? And, and then we get into the issue of the law. Because the law... In today's world where everything is relative, it's too black and white. I'm, I'm telling you guys, I have just numerous conversations with people that, that are not believers. And invariably, it's, you know what, it's all relative. Like what you believe can be right, what I believe can be right, and what, what they believe, all the religions can be right. No, they can't be. Folks, we have to establish from the beginning there is a truth, there is a hard truth 
Murder is either right or wrong. Jesus is either the way or not the way. I mean, he said, I am the way. That means Buddha or somebody else cannot be. There's one way. He said either he's a liar or he's the way. You, got, you have to figure that there's things that we have to struggle with. So if you were born in the, you know, in the Dr. Phil generation, in the Oprah Winfrey generation where everybody gets a prize, guys, second place is just the first loser, right? <laughs> there's a first place and then there's second place and there's third place. It's not like everybody gets a participation trophy, right? We have to understand that there's the truth. It's black and white. And the Old Testament deals with a lot of that. You know, when it gives the law out, there's consequences for it. And that's very tough to deal with. That's why people don't like the Old Testament. And then there's the, the other side of it, the people that love the Old Testament too much, right? The ones where, they, I mean, they're always going back to, the, now, hey, man, this is a temple. You've got to be like, they're, they're all, they almost want you to bring a sacrifice in here, right? And you've got to do this and wear tassels for this or, and do these things. And you know what? You have to celebrate all the Jewish holidays. And Sabbath is the, like, you've got to do it on a Saturday. That's the way it is. And, and really, uh, to the point where it's like, um, I'm really hoping that, uh, well, we'll go with this. You, you know how, like, there's people that will accuse you. We have this, like, creamer in our house, this, like, little uh, thing that you pour creamer out of. It's shaped like a cow, right? And people will say, oh, that looks like that golden calf from the Bible. That's an idol, right? Which is ridiculous. But, like, you can't even have it, you know, or, or, or some statue or, you know, some trophy. I mean, people to the point of going, like, why, why do you have all these Old Testament idols in your house? It's like, it's a trophy. I got it in high school. Let me keep it, you know? It's to the other extent, right? So we've got two sides of this when we look at it. And we have to kind of understand what the Old Testament's all about. All of that to bring us back into Acts 11. And we're going to read the first part and, uh, and tackle some of these issues. Acts chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Folks, if, you, if this seems familiar, previously on Acts series, Anna totally talked about it last time, Right? So he's retelling the story. He said, looking at it closely, I observed the animals and the beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven, and behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, uh, in which, I lost my place, uh, which we were, uh, in which we were sent uh, to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen the angel and stand, uh, stand in his house and say to jo send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. It's a significant passage. We'll pause there. We'll address the second half in a little bit. But here's what's happening, folks. So let's retell the story and kind of understand what's happening right? Anatoly did a lot of that last time, but just so that we can understand how this pertains to law. Peter broke the law. Peter 
broke the law. In fact, he broke several major Jewish laws. One was a, a whole set of laws around what you can do with food. The other was uh, one that was actually not in the Old Testament, but was made up by Pharisees and priests of that time, the rabbis of that time, that said, y- you sh- really shouldn't go and visit and welcome Gentiles, people that are not Jewish, into your home. And so th- these were major Jewish laws. Again, the church is just starting off. Peter was a former Jewish guy that, f- that discovered Christ. He's becoming, th- entering into this new faith that's called Christianity, It's all kind of new to him. He's still sticking to a lot of the Old Testament. It's very important to him because we'll read it for, there's a lot of reasons why it's important, right? So he comes back to Jerusalem after having broken these laws and somebody pulls him aside, right? They they hear about what's happening. So he comes back, somebody pulls him aside and just dresses him down, just rips into him. Peter, what did you do? I mean, you're a church elder. Like, how could you? Peter, like this is embarrassing for the church. How could you break the Old Testament laws? Like we thought that was a part of what we believed in. You know, and maybe the local newspaper had, hey, church elder caught in a scandal. This was scandalous. For us, we understand, I mean, it, we, it's, it, it's not the same to us now having understood the Old Testament, but at that time, they didn't have the New Testament to fall back on. It was the Old Testament, right? So you broke the law. And Peter has to defend himself. So he stands up and he said, guys, here's what was happening. I was on the roof. I saw a vision. All these animals come down on a sheet. And not only was there visual, there was audio, right? So it's, it's AV system here. God speaks down and says, listen, you've got to eat this stuff. This is for you. And Peter said, listen, God, I don't eat this. I don't like this buffet. I don't like what you've got to offer here. It's not kosher. Well, here's what kosher is. I went online to koshercertification.org and, um, and really had them break it down for me. Here's what, meant, well, here's what it meant to be kosher, right? Here's what Peter would have eaten. Um, it had to be the right animal. It had to chew cud and had split hooves to be a certain ty- or be a certain type of bird or fish. So here's what you couldn't eat. You couldn't eat pork, right? No bacon, no shrimp, no lobster, and uh, most of the birds were fine, but you couldn't eat, like, eagles, right? So not a big deal. Uh, but lobster you couldn't have. Shrimp, you, you know, like, it's tough, right? Had to be killed by a traditional slaughterer in a way that didn't cause the animal pain, which is nice. Um, but here's what happens. God doesn't, like, send a slaughterer down or a special person to help him butcher this, this you know, smorgasbord of animals. He's like, dude, you got to kill right here on the spot. And then... Uh, if, if a kosher animals or kosher meat is soaked in tubs of water because there were laws about that you couldn't eat blood, right? Nothing bloody, you couldn't eat it. Well, Peter didn't have the time to soak all this stuff in, in water, right? So, so he, it would have been bloody. So there's another law that he broke. So the kosher certification guys at this point are appalled, right? They're like, Peter, you monster. Like, who are you even? Like, do you, are you even a believer? Like, well, you can't do this. And so Peter's got to give himself a defense. Now, uh, and he does say, he says, guys, I I resisted. Like, I was God. I'm not going to do it. Three times. I was resisting this. I know that this is not, like, this is not going to look good if I report this back to you guys. I'm resisting this. And then he breaks a second law, and he he talks about that. He says, well, yeah, we, we went, and I actually took six brothers with me just in case. I wanted them to be there as a witness, and I'm preaching, and these guys getting saved, and we baptize them, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and it's just this, all of this is happening. I mean, there's something going on here. I know I broke these laws, but God is creating change in the church. God is creating change, and here's the point. He says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. God wasn't just trying to change Peter's eating habits, right? It's not like he doesn't say, if you're a believer, you have to eat meat and vegetarians can't go to heaven. It's about showing that it's about God, not about the law. Now, here's where we get to the note-taking part. Seven purposes of the law. What's the purpose of law to begin with, right? So let's break this down. You guys can have this in your notes, and it's good to refer back to. I think we've got some PowerPoint slides on this. Um, the, the, the seven purposes, 
Nope, next slide. There we go. Seven reasons for the law. The number one is this. The law, the Old Testament, reveals the holy character of God. The law reveals the holy character of God. When you look at the Old Testament, it talks about God. Yes, with the flood. Yes, with all the killing. Yes, all, all of that, the, the ter- extermination of nations. All of that speaks to the holiness of God. Here's how. Holy, if, if you're new to church, and holy seems like a fancy word uh, for whatever, I would agree, but here's, here's a very simple formula. Holy is perfect. Holy is perfect. So when we talk about a holy God, we're talking about a perfect God. Now here's another equation. Sin. Well, sin is not relevant, uh, uh, relative. Sin equals imperfection. So anything that is not perfect, that is imperfection, right? It is, it is a part of what we call sin. It's not God. It is distant from God. It misses the mark of what God is. So God is perfect. There is no evil in him. He is absolutely perfect, divine in every single way. People are imperfect. People sometimes ask, does God send evil into the world? What about all the evil in the world, right? Look, why can't God stop all this evil? Well, he can. He absolutely can. Well, why doesn't he then? If he doesn't stop the evil, that means God is an evil God. Well, no, not necessarily. Because we understand God being perfect, he's also patient. The evil in this world is caused by our imperfection, by our sin. We're responsible for the evil. Don't blame it on God. That's, that's a human problem. Now, God can wipe that out. But if God begins to wipe out evil, guess who's going to get caught up in that? Somehow we like to draw that line like, well, God, I want you to kill ISIS, but not me. Well, guess what? You're imperfect, too. I mean, you maybe haven't killed some people lately. Nobody knows what's buried in your backyard. <laughs> but we like to say, I'm, a good, I'm good enough. Well, no, guess what? God is perfect. You're imperfect. God did that before. He wiped out the population of the world minus Noah and a couple folks. You know, he, he, could, he could wipe out a lot of that evil in this world. But we would all be caught up in that. So God is patient. He allows for the world to be as is right now, even as he calls people to himself and says, guys, you're imperfect. I am holy. You will be destroyed if, if perfection, armed with the power of God, faces our imperfection, it's going to wipe it out for the sake of all that is good and right. It needs to wipe out imperfection. It needs to destroy sin. Ergo, we should all be destroyed because we are imperfect in front of a perfect God. Okay? So that's what the Old Testament talks about. It talks about a perfect God. Number two, the Old Testament, the the law, sets apart the nation of Israel from all the other nations. Um, he gives the law first to the Jewish nation. And, and basically the law, as we read it, it's, it's guidelines. If you follow those guidelines, you're not going to be perfect. But it's a semblance of, of rules and, and, and reg- that God puts in place and said, listen, I need you guys to at least understand what perfection looks like. Don't kill people. Don't steal. Don't lust. Don't want after things. Th- these are things, just basic rules that you have to understand, that you have to follow to get away from the imperfection that you live in, the imperfect humans that you are. Here's some patches. Here's some bad. Here's what it needs to be like. So that's what it does. He gives it first to the nation of Israel. It kind of sets them apart. They're starting to follow these rules. Number three, it provides a way of worship for the community of faith through yearly feasts. Here's, this is another reflection of God, right? He said, listen, here's some times of celebration for the Jewish nation. I am a social God. I like to commune with people. I like to fellowship with people. I want you to do the same, to love the people around you. Have fun with them, right? Eat, drink, music, fellowship together. There are feasts. There are celebrations. That's fun. That's good. God wants that, right? So he gives that. Number four, provide God's direction for the physical and spiritual health of the nation. There were some civil code here, right? In in the Old Testament, there's some civil code. Um, We don't follow that here. In fact, the people that study the Old Testament said that most of the law that's written there, you really can't even do it outside of Israel. It really applies to that patch of land, to that government, right? 
Um, uh, there's you know, stuff about putting railings up. That's in our civil code. But God gave that to the people of Israel. He said, guys, you, you watch out for the safety of people, right? You have to do this. And here's some punishment for stealing. And here's what happens when somebody gets killed. And he just kind of gives them an outline of some punishments, some general rules for how to govern the nation, right? So that's another um, purpose of the Old Testament. Number five, reveal the sinfulness of man. Reveal the sinfulness of of man. The law reveals the sinfulness of man. By giving us the Ten Commandments, by giving us the law in the Old Testament, we now have a barometer that is reasonable in our mind against which we measure ourselves. We know that God is perfect in any way, but when we try to define perfection, it's tough. We as humans don't understand it. We're imperfect. But when we have these rules that we can kind of line up against, Ten Commandments, do not murder, do not steal, love God with all your heart, you know, honor the Sabbath, don't want what's your name. I mean, Ten Commandments, right? You guys know them. And when we look at, our, at the Ten Commandments and we think, well, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not an adulterer. And then Jesus said in the New Testament, well, it's not about adultery per se. You don't have to sleep around. It's about the lust that lives in your heart. And all of a sudden we realize, ah, I don't think I measure up to that. Well, I'm not a murderer. True. And then Jesus said, but, but if you hate your brother in your heart, then you have committed murder. And we say, wow, that's a little bit more stricter than I thought. I guess, I guess I'm not perfect. You know, there's, there's some anger issues I'm working through. Well, do you keep the Sabbath? Do you ever say the Lord's name in vain? Do you ever, uh, have you ever stolen anything? Down to a penny, right? We're talking about perfection here. Well, I mean, I might have stolen a pen at work. Well, listen, that, that's stealing. And so when we begin to measure up ourselves against the law, just the law, I'm not even talking about the perfect God, just the law, we begin to see that we are sinful and imperfect. As tough as it is to admit, this is why people don't like the Old Testament, because when you read it, you're like, oh, come on, it's, it's, all it is is telling me how bad I am. Yeah, that's true. We're not good. We're not good people. We're imperfect. We are imperfect, right? No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The Old Testament's not going to save you. It's not going to show you how to live a good life. It'll tell you that you're living a bad life because here's a, some characteristics of what a good life is but it's not going to save you. So ultimately, it had to, there was, were, were some rules there, number six, provide forgiveness through sacrifice and offerings. Jesus didn't die in the Old Testament, right? So what had to happen there was they had a system where you could take this lamb, it would live with you in your house. Your kids would love it, right? It was like a pet. Imagine like your pet puppy. And then in a certain amount of time, you would go and you would sacrifice that lamb at the temple. Who here would want to sacrifice a pet? Yeah, if you raise your hand, we're calling PETA on you. You don't want to sacrifice your know, pet, you know, it's something you love. But people had to understand that the punishment for sin is death. Perfection destroys imperfection. And in order for you to not be destroyed, there had to be something innocent of your sin, of your imperfection, that had to be destroyed. And in that case, it was this animal, or maybe it was a bird, or in some situations, or a cattle. You had to understand that there, is, there are consequences to you living life the way you live your life. There are real damning consequences to the sin in your life. Now, in the Old Testament, those, the consequences were, were laid out or were punished, you know, these animals. But in the New Testament, it's different. And so the last, number seven, the purpose of the Old Testament and the law, it showed people that it wasn't the answer, but only the questions that Jesus would answer. It showed people that it wasn't the answer, but only the questions that Jesus would answer. It never was about keeping the law. That's something the Jewish nation kind of missed as it went along because they thought, well, if we could keep the law, 
If only we could keep the law, then we'll be saved. And they went to just ridiculous lengths to do it. Uh, there is in our, uh, right around the Arden Arcade area, um, uh, the local synagogue, the Orthodox synagogue, has put up a string. They, it covers several blocks each way. And, uh, and the string is there to signify almost a, uh, like a property line. Because the Jewish nation today believes, Judaism believes that uh, if, if, you know, on the Sabbath, there's, there's laws about you can't walk outside of your house a certain distance on the Sabbath. But if you have a property line and you guys technically call this whole area your own property, then you could walk around it, right? So they're going to these ridiculous lengths to try to fulfill the law and get around these rules but still fulfill them. I was, uh, another example, right? Holiday. Well, you can't miss a holiday. Well, what if you're traveling or lost and you, you forget what day it is exactly? Like, is it a Tuesday or is it a Wednesday? Well, guess what? We're going to celebrate two days just in case, right? Because you don't want to break the law. That's, that's your only measure of salvation. That's how you get saved. You keep the law and then you get saved. And that's why Apostle Paul uh, in, uh, speaks about this. And then in Hebrews, we read about it too. He said, listen, people weren't saved by keeping the law. They were saved by faith. Let me ask you this. How many laws did Abraham fulfill? What law did Abraham have? Nothing. He didn't have the law. How many laws did the people, the Hebrew people in Egypt fulfill in order for God to say to them, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll rescue you from Egypt, I'll give you guys a land? Nothing, right? So it was never about the Old Testament. It was never about keeping the law in the Old Testament. It, wasn't, it only brought up questions that needed to be answered. It only pointed to something that was greater. There was something else that had to come, and it had to be Jesus, somebody who was perfect, who was sinless, who was righteous, who would come and be killed and be able to take that punishment that imperfection requires. And so that now he can stand before God and say, Father, the people that will come to you and have accepted me as their Savior, the people that recognize and, and speak out and... and um, just repent of their sin, that recognize that they're imperfect, and cling to me and say, Jesus, we need you because you were perfect. I will take that punishment on myself. So that when we die, folks, when we die, this is, we as believers believe this with all our heart. When we die, our spirit is risen up. Our sinful body stays here, but we are given a new body that is perfect and sinless and holy that can be with God forever. That's the, the whole plan of salvation right there, folks. You're imperfect. Jesus is perfect. You repent of your sins now. And when you die, your soul can have that perfect body to be with Jesus forever. We understand that. Here's a couple of points of practical application, folks. There is no law you can be followed to be saved. I think we made that pretty clear. There is no law you can follow to be saved. Here's a very sad truth, and this may apply to some of you guys here as well, and I'm really sorry, but, but here's the very sad truth. There are thousands, millions, maybe billions of people if you, whose whole plan of salvation is that, hey, if I die, something happens, I'm going to stand before God, and I'm going to say I'm good enough, or I wasn't that bad. Really? That's your whole, you really thought this through, didn't you? That's your whole plan. That when you die, you're going to stand before a perfect God that controls the universe, planets down to the atom, out to the furthest reaches of, of the universe, millions of light years away. You're going to stand before that God and you're going to say, you know what, I was pretty good. I wasn't that bad. Folks, Disneyland won't let you on a roller coaster if you're not that high. McDonald's won't let you into the pay palace if you're higher than that. We've tried. If McDonald's won't bend, 
why do you think God would bend? Seriously. If your whole plan of salvation is to say, I'm good enough, trust me, you're not. Nobody is good enough. Nobody's even close to good enough. I want to quote Dennis uh, Prager, Prager, a nationally syndicated radio talk show host. He wrote a column about goodness. He writes, and I quote him now, in 20 years as a talk show host, I realized that people, that, that perhaps the major reason for political and other disagreement I had with callers was that they believed people are basically good and I did not. He goes on to state, the problems that arise from believing that people are born good, quote unquote, the most notable went like this. If you believe that people are basically good, God and religion are morally unnecessarily, unnecessary, even harmful. Why would basically good people need a God or religion to provide moral standard? Why would basically good people need a God or religion to provide moral standards? Well, we wouldn't if we were good but we're imperfect and sinful. Every single person here, every single person in the world. And that's why we need Jesus. I'll give you another quick illustration. One of my clients is a multi-billionaire, very fortunate to work with this man, incredibly sharp and smart. Well, he has a son. He's about my age. And the son is somewhat new to the industry, right? So he's, he's still trying to catch up, still trying to learn some things. Uh, in terms of how to do it, do, you know, things. Um, I've been doing this since I was 18. So there's probably a difference in our experience level and what we're capable of and, and how we approach things. When this gentleman dies, who do you think is going to inherit his business? Who here thinks it's going to be me? You guys have no faith. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. <laughs> I really appreciate You want to put a word in for me a little bit? Yeah. Who here thinks it's going to be his son? Okay. You're a lot more reasonable than Peter. (laughs) As much as I appreciate the vote of confidence. It's going to be his son. Like there's absolutely nothing I can do to make him write me into the will other than maybe like a cease and desist and a like... Keep him away from my business, maybe. That's about all I'll get. Because he loves his son. It's his son. It's his family. It's his blood. It's the guy that's going to get everything he owns. Well, folks, how are you going to come before God and expect and expect eternal life with him forever when you are not his child, when you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you've never accepted that you are sinful and imperfect. It's not going to happen. And that is why, again, the Old Testament speaks to, say, listen, you can't follow the law. The law is not going to save you. What you need to do is become the child of God. You've got to repent. You've got to come to God, accept a sacrifice. Another practical application here, it's not about the letter, but it's about the spirit. It's not about the letter, but it's about the spirit. Calvin, from Calvin and Hobbes fame, comes home all grimy, dirty, you know, just been playing out with the tiger out in the mud, and his mom takes one look at him, and she's like, you get in the tub, mister. So the next frame, you see him sitting in the tub, the big grin on his face, the water's not turned off, turned on, rather, and he says, I'm going to follow the letter, but not the spirit, right? Right? How many times do we do that, right? I remember my parents telling us, well, you guys clean the house. Well, cleaning the house by my standards was you never even got the vacuum out, right? I cleaned the house. What did you do? Well, I put the cushions back on the couch from the fort. We follow the letter, not really the spirit, right? It's not about the letter. And we understand this, even as the Jewish nation tries so hard to follow the letter, we look back and we say, listen, this is not the answer, it's the question. There are good things here that we can follow, there are good lessons to be learned here, but we don't take everything there literally. We understand that God wants to teach us some lessons there, and it's about the spirit um, uh, of what's happening here. We know that he said, don't adulter, 
because he wants strong families. We know that he says you must punish your kids when they're misbehaving, when they don't listen to you, because we need more people in this country that are self-disciplined and not bratty and grown up and and self-entitled, right? We know there are rules there for a reason, so we take the spirit of the law. We understand what God's trying to teach us, and we apply that. And finally, last practical application for this first section, trust God to judge or justify my dad always would tell me, um, he said, Pete, if you want to be a leader to men, if you, if you want to help people out, be very strict with yourself and very lenient with others. Judge yourself very harshly, but justify the, other, the actions of others. And let's be honest, we like to flip that around. No, 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 I'm a good person, but my neighbor, right? My, what, you should see what my brother does. That guy, I mean... I I I can't believe Jesus loves them, right? We like to say, they're the bad people. I'm going to justify. No, no, no. Judge yourself first, right? And we read that even even in Matthew 7 when he said, take that plank out of your own eye before you go put the speck out of somebody else's. Judge yourself harshly and be very lenient to the people around them. Bless them, pray with them, love on them. But judge yourself harshly. And in everything, before you go do and he judging. Bring that to God. Because what God has made clean, man, maybe there's some work that God's done in that life that you don't know about. Right? Anyway, that's the first part. We're going to dive back into Acts, and we're going to wrap this up here uh, looking at the church in Antioch. So we're going to read from verse 19 and wrap up this chapter. From verse 19. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephan traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians." Now, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, called Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. There's a little historical reference. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Guys, there's a lot to unpack here. We're not even... We're, there's a lot of subjects we're just going to have to skip um, and just hit kind of the main points here. But here's a couple of takeaways that I want us to have from this passage. One, ordinary people focused on making disciples. Ordinary people focused on making disciples. Here's what happens. Antioch is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. About 200,000 people at that time. And these guys... New converts, they just found out about Jesus, and all of a sudden there's persecution, right? They're being pursued, they're being killed. So it's not like persecution, somebody wrote negative things on their Facebook page, right? That's persecution in America. Real persecution. Like, they're getting killed. So they get sent out, they're no longer in Jerusalem, and they said, listen, let's go preach somewhere, let's go to Antioch, and there's maybe living opportunities there, we can take care of our families Normal, ordinary people trying to find a better life for themselves. They move to Antioch, and they don't have a lot to offer. I mean, they're moving to a new town, and there's not a lot going on. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have a church building, right? They don't have a great musical program. You know, it's not like, let's bring Mike up, you know? Let's have him on. They don't have any of that. They don't have, like, the way of the master, Right? Like, how did people even come to Jesus before the way of the master? I don't know. But they didn't have any of that. It's just ordinary people coming to, into a city with one focus. As we live our life, how do we make disciples? 
I'll give you an illustration from present day Cuba. This is from David Platt, great, great pastor. Um, but he visited Cuba, and he writes, in Cuba, the church has to stay under the radar. It has to stay under the radar. It's, it's a communist nation, uh, and one, one pastor said it's like having a ceiling above us. You, you've got to kind of stay under the radar. If, you, if you're too prominent of a church, if you're too, they'll kind of come in and, and screw things up, and they'll chop your head off, right, literally sometimes. So you've got to really kind of keep things under the radar. You've got to keep things small and, and use small groups and small groups of believers to spread the gospel. Well, how effective is that? Well, let me tell you. David goes into one of the church's tiny group of people, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 people. That church has planted 60 other churches. Praise God, amen? Amen. Well, then David goes to one of the church plants, talks to them, new church. That church's already planted 25 other churches. Praise God, amen? amen? Guys, it begins to spread like wildfire because these people, the, these people in Cuba have that focus of making disciples. They figure it out it's not about the building, the program, the musical team. Like, let's get them really expensive drums because that'll really save people, you know? Let's get him a really good guitar. Let's get him a better piano or an organ. It wasn't about that. It was about people being focused on making disciples. They brought one pastor before, like, the communist board, the local officials, and, and, and they, they bring him up there. They, you know, they want to imprison him, and the guy brings with him, like, this huge boulder and just slams it down on the table in front of him. They're like, what is this all about? And he's like... If you guys, in Spanish or in Cuban, whatever, he's like, if you guys imprison me, if you guys shut me up, this boulder will speak instead of me. They thought he was crazy, so they let him go. <laughs> and so he's still speaking, and he's still preaching. Because he was so focused on making disciples. Uh, uh, D- David asked one of the pastors there, he, he spoke with the regional pastor, he's like, dude, can you just, just tell me the secret? What's the secret? He gets his notebook out, notebook out, getting ready to write it down. He said, it's very easy. Make disciples. Make disciples. Not decisions. Not just, hey, uh, five people came out today. That's awesome. Hey, praise God, five people got saved. No, disciples. Taking people that come out, pay, taking people that turn to God and, and teaching them and raising them up and sending them out again and saying, listen, our church is too big. We're not going to build in another parking lot. You guys go out and start your own church. You guys go out and minister to your community now. You go out there and start churches, spread churches. Folks, and I've spoken about this before, small churches, new churches, will grow almost three or four times as fast as large churches. When you get to a certain like, level, a certain amount of people, you begin to kind of just chill, right? You stop growing. But small churches, small startups, even like this English service, right? It begins to grow. It begins to attract people. Statistics will pair that out. Jesus talks about that. And what if we don't have technology? What if we don't have a lot of great things? But we have the Spirit of God. And is that not all that we need? Ordinary people just focused on making disciples. It wasn't like the pastor. It wasn't Peter. It was ordinary people, folks, each one of us. God will mobilize his church. That's the second point from this section. God will mobilize his church. Folks, there's great news. Some of you guys have been praying a long time for God to send ministers into the church or out. And God, make all these people come to Jesus. There's awesome news. God has a plan how to do it. It involves you. It involves you. God will mobilize his church. And he will do it. He's, he's, he's creative. God is super creative. Listen, if you're on fire today for Jesus and you want to serve him and you want to go speak to people, that's awesome. God's going to send you awesome opportunities. I mean, he sent Philip to the desert and there was somebody there for him to preach, right? God's going to give you more opportunities than what you know about. If you today are stuck in some place, you're, 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 you're in a place in in your life where you want to serve God, but you're just stuck. You've got so much going on. Well, guess what happens? God can bring persecution. God can bring trouble. 
You can get laid off. You can have a sickness in the family. There's a death in the family. Something happens. There's tragedy. But God will shake that thing up. Oh, he'll shake it up. You can't stay in Jerusalem. You can't stay at home. You can't stay with your friends. Too stuck with your friends? Well, they're all going to get married and move to a different state. Well, you're too stuck to your parents? Well, maybe God's going to take them away and take them home. Or they'll kick you out of the house. <laughs> right? Well, you're too stuck to your church? Well, your church might kick you out and say, go start a church somewhere. You know? Or something might happen where, where there's conflict. Whatever might happen, guys, I don't, I don't know, but God's going to do things. He's going to shake things up. He's going to mobilize this church. We know that. And some of us are, you know, we're like mollusks that are just stuck to this rock. Like, God's not getting me out of this church. I'm going to sit in this pew forever. God's going to figure out a way. He'll get you out. Because the other alternative, the third way, is if you're really stuck to that pew and you really can't get out there and speak, God can just shut the church down. Happens every week in America. Churches closing down, closing down, old members dying off. There's no new people in there, no missions work. God will just close the door up, turn off the light. Because down the street, there's another church that's out there and missional and sees a vision and sees the purpose and they're reaching out to people and he's going to say, hey, they've got my blessing. They're doing something. But if your church isn't, if you're not doing anything, let's just shut off the lights right now and just stop paying your electric bill because it's useless. God will mobilize his church, folks. And it's about going out into the community and not, not coming here and being comfortable here. David Platt, let's not create safe places for us to witness to people and instead go out into the dangerous places where there are lost people. A lot of times we spend so much energy, let's make church a safe place for people, and let's bring them in here, and then the pastor will tell them about Jesus. Well, it's not about the pastor telling them about Jesus. It's about you telling them about Jesus. And it's not about bringing them in church. It's, it's, listen, if you're here for the first time right now, it's kind of strange. Like, I've never seen a chair this long, this wide, right? Who sits in pews in your, like, do you have pews at home? Right? It's a little new. It's different. We've got to be out there speaking to people, helping people understand who God is and what you believe in. All right? And then the last po point here, last point here, make Jesus your identity. Make Jesus your identity. This is the first time we read they were called Christians. There in Antioch, this was the first time they were called Christians. Well, what were they called before? Well, they were all Baptists before. Joking. They were all followers of the way. They were all followers of the way. And here, people were looking at these people, and, and they, they said, listen, there's something about them. They're following this guy named Christ. We're going to call them Christians. So here, let me challenge you guys as we start to wrap up. If people today look at your life, think about your friends, what would they title your religion based on your actions? What would they title your religion based on your actions today? Would they say he's the, oh, they're the judgers. He's from that judging religion. Or he's from the, uh, the unfriendlies, you know, that unfriendly, they, they, don't, they don't ever want to talk to you. Or maybe it's completely different. Oh, he's so business-minded. He must worship a god of money or something. Or she's too fashion-minded. She's all about beauty. And, and maybe, she, I don't know what religion she worships, right? Oh, he's too focused on success and raising up him and making him, just leading. We don't know. He's from the, that leadership, that, that overbearing, bossy religion. We don't know what to call it. Or maybe it's about ethnicity, Right? Oh, he's from the Russians. It's almost like a religion. From the Hispanics, from the maybe Asian or, you know, black, whatever. He's, ah, that religion. The religion of, of race almost, because that's all he ever talks about. It's not about Jesus. It's not about Christ. It's about Mother Russia. <laughs> right? He's from that religion. He's from that big church religion, from the churchgoer religion. 
Or are they going to say, no, 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 he's a Christian. What, what do you mean? I mean, the, the guy is like nonstop talking about Jesus. He's from the Jesusers, you know, from that Jesus religion. Because that's all he ever talks about. Man, you look at his life. You look at the way he lives. He's a Christian. He is a Christian. I'll end with this thought. Uh, I know we've mentioned it before, but just, a, just a, good, a good thought to end on before we pray. If you were in Cuba today, or in China, or in India, and somebody brought you before the local judge for spreading the gospel or for being a Christian, would the prosecutor have enough evidence on you to say that you're a Christian? Or would the judge dismiss the case? If people tried hard today to prove that you were a Christian, could they? Can people really tell that you're a believer and a Christian? Or are you just a churchgoer in that big church? Or heck, you've keeping it hidden for so long they don't even know that you're a believer. In a court of law, could people prove that you are a Christian? Folks, that's kind of what I want us to think about as we go into prayer and worship, if we can call the band up. And let's all just stand as we go into prayer. Um, I want us all to have just a minute of, of, of just communing with God in a fellowship. If you guys don't mind, let's just, just close our mind just to kind of block out distractions. Nothing special is going to happen when your eyes are closed. Nobody's going to steal your money or anything. Guys, it's, it's about you and God right now. If you don't believe in a God, guess what? He's here anyway, folks. So you and God right now. And I just want to give us about 30 seconds where we can just kind of stand, silently stand before God. And he who knows who we are on the inside. He who knows whether you are a true believer or not. Whether you're suffering and, and, and maybe wrestling with some doubt. Or maybe there's something else going on in your life. God knows all that. So I'm just going to... Be quiet for about 30 minutes, 30 seconds, as we just kind of bring it all to God. Father, we come before you now as imperfect people. We see that Based on the law and the Old Testament, we know that we can't even come close to what perfection is. We, we've got nothing on you. And God, we, we come before you wanting to have eternal life in you. Death can come at any time. We, we understand that. That's this life we live in. Father, we, we want eternity with you. We want, we want to know who you are and be with you forever. And Dad, that the only way we can do that is if we grasp onto Jesus Christ uh, as our Savior, if we can admit who we are, sinful, imperfect people, and know that you are perfect, then you can forgive. Father, we also come before you and we understand that sometimes as believers, we lose track of who we worship and who we are. And uh, the religion we worship takes on a different name other than Christianity. God, it's, it's not about... It's not about the denomination even. It's not about our actions um, that we try to prove. That, but it, it's about who we are inside of that relationship with you and then that'll express itself in, in our life. I just pray that each one of us can walk out of here and um, live a life that, that can be called Christianity with pride that you would be proud of, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.